GPA is completely unweighted, and therefore we have no way to rank our students. So there is no rank, there's no ranking system because the GPA is entirely unweighted. Now the follow-up question to that usually is, then how do colleges really make sense of that GPA? Um, and we really talk to our kids a lot about saying, you know, let's not get so hyper-focused on that number without context around it. Let's not really, really fixate on just that GPA, just that sheer number, because there's so much behind and around that number itself, because again, it's unweighted. So a 3.0 really means nothing. What kind of classes did you take? What kind of rigor did you have? Did you have an upward progression throughout the years? And what I mean by that is, did a student maybe have a little bit of a shaky ninth grade, but they tended, you know, they started doing a little bit better sophomore year. They did really good, you know, they had a great solid junior year. Um, and they had an upward progression, and that's the best indicator of their sort of college readiness. So again, that GPA, yes, it's unweighted, but colleges do have a really, really strong sense of the type of student, you know, they are based on the fact that the rigor is depicted, um, and they can see the breakdown of the courses on the transcript. I would just add, um, an, an admissions officer is going to be looking at different transcripts, maybe within the same school, maybe comparing different schools. They're, if they are not familiar with the high schools of the two different applicants, let's just say, um, they have a school profile, which every high school provides, which provides a, a snapshot of the high school's rigor and average SAT scores, ACT scores, the number of AP courses that we offer. Um, all different statistics, and it basically gives the admissions officer a sense of how competitive the high school is, and really that's more important, because um, the GPA can be very relative, and you see it inflated on college admissions websites all over the place. Everyone seems to be a 3.897, whatever it is. Um, so it's all relative, admissions officers know that. They know the rigor of the high school. If they don't, they have a school profile, a document in every high school that can basically um, allow them to tell which high school is super competitive, which one is not, not as competitive, so. So we have some questions um, about some of the financial aid forms. For example, what is a CSS profile? Do we need to fill out a FAFSA for merit aid as well? I knew Emily was gonna take this. Um, and can the FAFSA be submitted after the result of an admission? Okay. I can repeat any of those if you need me to. Um, so the first one were the different forms that are filled out specifically the CSS profile. Um, so there are two main forms when you're completing um, financial aid uh, to get a financial aid packet. Um, there's the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, and that is for um, federal monies, um, whether it is work study, uh, federal loans, um, or grants or scholarships that come from the government. Um, then there is the CSS profile, which is um, incidentally through College Board. I'm still not how, sure how that one worked out, but, um, and that is typically private institutions um, that want a little bit more financial information um, than you have to provide on the FAFSA. But the CSS profile is typically for institutional aid. Um, sometimes merit scholarships um, or other institutional aid that, scho that schools have. Um, one of the questions was, do you need to fill out the FAFSA for merit scholarships? Typically, no, uh, but there are occasionally schools that will say, yes, we want um, you to complete the FAFSA for merit, for merit scholarships. So you want to make sure that you are looking at the websites um, to find out what their policies are. There was one more. Yeah, could you just speak to, um, can, can the form be submitted after the result of admission? And also, do financial aid decisions get made at, at the time of early decision, uh, decisions? Okay. Um, so can you submit an app uh, financial aid, the financial aid forms after admission? Yes, you can. Um, financial aid forms, specifically the FAFSA, is open for one calendar year. Um, so you can submit them after. The only thing to keep in mind is that um, submitting them after would significantly decrease your chances for aid um, because they've given up so much of their funds, whether it's federal or institutional, um, during the application process. Um, 
when you're applying the early decision, you do want to get that at your financial aid um, information in as soon as possible. Um, and it will depend on the school whether they consider it during that financial, uh, during the early application period. Okay, so we have um, a question regarding the quarter one grades and the grading timeline and um, how those line up with the early admission deadlines. And how does that work? Um, I, I'm the technical person. I don't know if you could tell. Um, I like the very solid answers, questions and answers. Um, so for uh, first quarter grades, if a student is applying um, in the early round, typically November 1st, November 15th, the first transcript that is sent out will not have first quarter grades on them. The registrar's office will follow up once um, grades are published in Aspen with first quarter grades. And colleges can either take those into consideration or say, we just want to look at freshman, sophomore, and junior year grades. Speaking of which, is early admission um, easier than it is regular admission? Is it easier for a student to get in? So, I feel like this is one of those ones where maybe counselors might say something slightly different, um, depending on who you talk to, but um, early decision in theory should give you a, a slight bump for most colleges, um, but I think the caveat is that you're applying with all other um, very highly competitive students as well, highly competitive applicants, so um, it's not as if, if the average accepted GPA is a 3.6 for this particular college. If you apply early decision with a 3.2, you're just you're going to get in, no problem. Um, you still need to really be around what they're looking for in terms of the GPA, the test scores. Um, early decision is not typically going to give you a significant um, bump, uh, but it should help a little bit. I mean, it's just a, a common sense um, theory in that. Uh, you're committing to the school. I mean, you're saying you're going to attend there, and colleges tend to like that for their yield. So it can give you a, um, a little bit of a bump usually um, with early action, typically not so much. So I think we also sort of caution our students too and talk to them a lot about, especially in junior seminar, but even now we're having a lot of conversations, especially this week around whether early admission, whether it's ED or EA, is advantageous for every single applicant. Um, and you have to really think about it as a student. And so what we usually say is if you're a student who has been really consistent throughout your three years thus far, and you're continuing in that consistency so far already in senior year, and you meet or exceed the profile of the college that you're looking at, you're probably a good candidate for early. I think that's sort of a no-brainer, but I think where it gets gray and where it gets much more complicated is again, I'll go back to when I was talking about the GPA. If you're a student who's had a really significant upward progression, meaning maybe freshman year wasn't as strong, and then again, you did a little bit better sophomore year, had a really solid junior year, and now senior year, you really understand who you are as a learner, you're really you know, sort of mastering content, you're taking classes that you sort of really like this year, um, you know, it feels a little bit more like college, you're probably not a good early candidate. So you might want to show them two more quarters of senior year and apply again, as, as Tim said, um, under the regular admission program, which again is the most popular option. So not every student is a good early candidate, and I think that's something to really be aware of and really be thoughtful about and say, do I need to show this college two more quarters of grades, a whole semester of grades, to have a better chance, not only to raise my GPA, but because colleges tend to place so much more emphasis on junior and then the beginning of senior year as an indicator of their college readiness. So I think that's something we have to be really, really thoughtful about why we're applying early. Are we doing it to get, out of the, get it out of the way and to have an earlier response? But I think if we're really thoughtful about it and they're having those conversations with you and with us as their counselors, not everybody is a really solid early candidate. Can you talk about um, if a student changes their mind and um, wants to request a transcript that has missed the deadline for the date that they needed to request by? Oh, 
just a transcript for our school? Yeah. Like, so transcript request yeah. deadline for a college application. I, I, we're pretty flexible. I mean, I, I'm going to maybe answer that a little bit differently, but I think for the most part, the registrars are actual humans, so they're two humans that are, <laughs> you know, it's not like a robot thing where, you know, like you miss the deadline and that's it. They're wonderful. They're, they're receptive and warm and Certainly we don't encourage missed deadlines. We really try, you know, our best. It's a really big school and we have to be really respectful, you know, of their time and how many transcript requests they're processing. But for the most part, if a student changes their mind, they go on a visit a little bit late. That happens a lot with recruits. It happens a lot with Columbus Day weekend is a big visiting weekend. So we see that a lot. A lot of students, you know, go on Columbus Day weekend. That's mid-October, you know, and then they come back and they say, I fell in love with this school. I really want to do ED. We're not going to hold you back. I mean, it, they're, you know, again, I, I usually say bake them something really nice and go have a conversation in person if they like cookies. I would just add to that. Um, I, I don't think it takes a long time to register to process the transcript, secondary report. There's a number of documents that go. But if your student decided super late, keep in mind that um, the counselor has to write the recommendation that could take some time and they could already have a number of recommendations in the queue to be uh, to be written and the teacher recommendations as well so if they're looking to get it there november 1st and they decide late meaning october 5th versus like october halloween you know right. 31st that's a significant difference and we we cannot guarantee we'll get everything there on time so okay, so this next question might be directed at um our director uh, some parents are wondering about, um, we've had some changes in the staff over the past couple of years, so some students may have had several different counselors during that time, and uh, can you address how a counselor might get to know a senior if they haven't had them before, and how they might handle writing their counselor statement? Yep, that's a great question, and probably impacts about half the room. Um, we are a big department, we have 12 counselors, um, as you can see, we have six counselors that have started with us within the last two years. Um, so we're very thoughtful about that process. Um, our newer counselors will be reaching out to your student to set up one-on-one -on -one meetings. They will also be relying heavily on the um, student information packet. There's a question in there that asks what <coughs> teachers know you best. So they'll be checking in with other adults who have worked closely with your student over the past four years. If you are a student that is assigned to Ms. Kim, um, Ms. Kim and Ms. Shi are co-teaching senior seminars, and Ms. Shi did work very closely with Ms. McCoy's students, um, so there's a lot of information sharing that happens there, but rest assured that the counselor assigned to your student right now will be the person writing the recommendation and that they will be meeting with your child and reaching out to all of the adults in the building who have known your child over the past four years. You know, we really pride ourselves on bi-directional communication. If we have questions, we'll be reaching out to you and please feel free to call the counselor or supply additional information if you want to as well, and we encourage your child to do so. Um, can, you, can somebody talk a little bit about the role of the counselor in helping students develop a balanced list and um, making sure that they have the appropriate deadlines and, and whatnot? Um, so helping students develop um, a balanced list. Um, I know my practice is typically that I want students to take a look at um, Naviance to do either what's called a college search or um, it's a, another search program called Supermatch Super um, where they're going to put some information about what they're looking for in a school. Um, and then they can bring me that list and we can go through it together to say, you know, what are the things that you like about this school? or why do you think this is going to be a good fit? Um, and then we'll take a look at Naviance and that lovely graph that you had seen earlier um, to see where a student falls. You know, are they um, in the averages of students who have been accepted from Lexington High School? Um, and we go from there and say what we think would be um, a reach, a reasonable reach, a target, or a likely school. And I think there was a second part to that, yes. 
just um, at helping them manage the deadlines and, and making the right decisions, is that part of our, our practice? Um, I think not so much the managing the deadlines as far as um, we do give them the information and say these are when things are due, um, but we do tend to make it more student driven um, so that students are responsible for keeping track of their own deadlines um, and when they need to hand in um, critical information to ourselves and to the registrar's office. So this is a question about whether um, if a student isn't quite ready for college, but they're shooting to attend at some point down the road, do you recommend them having all their materials ready and applying while they're at LHS? Or is there some other recommendation that, that you might make? So I think while they have the momentum right now, I mean, I think it depends on a couple of reasons. And I think if they're not ready to attend college because they want to do something next year, for instance, um, around employment or a gap year, they want to do some volunteering or they want to have a meaningful year, and they know that attending a four-year college or a two-year college is their plan, but just not yet, I would try to honestly encourage that momentum right now and do everything while they have the resources of the counselor and the registrar. Um, you know, I think, it depends. I think if they're not in the space to be applying to college and they need to focus on their mental health and they're just not in the place to do the college application process, then that's a really different conversation. But if we're assuming that they do want to do that, they just want to fill next year with something different, I think do what they can now, especially when you know we can hold them a little bit accountable, when they have the space here, um, when they have support around filling out applications, that kind of thing, because we offer so many layers of support around filling out you know, the applications themselves. We offer consecutive iBlocks weeks. Jeremy Bateman, who spoke earlier, is going to be sort of heading um, an application sort of support for several weeks in a row. So I think while they have the resources, go ahead. And I'm gonna be, yeah. OK, so we do have a few students who are um, possibly trying to play uh, athletics in college and um, may have a few schools that are interested in applying to early decision. Can they apply and rest and request their transcripts for all, multiple schools early decision? And how, or how do they handle that process? This is our NCAA counselor. Well, I, I'm not. Thank you. <laughs> I actually didn't totally understand the question. Can they apply some multiple? So if they have a few schools that are, are recruiting them and they haven't made a decision yet on what school they're going to have a spot on, can they apply to, can they request transcripts for multiple ED schools and or apply? Well, they cannot apply to multiple ED schools, no. Um, they can certainly request transcripts to multiple schools and, um, the regular applications, but um, for early decision, no. Um, they would still have to choose one school ED, so. Uh, the way I explain it to students for ED, and sometimes they laugh at me, um, is that uh, if you apply to two or more schools um, early decision, and you were to get in to two or more schools early decision, you can't cut yourself in half or um, clone yourself to go to both schools. So that's sort of a simple way to, to look at it. Jeremy, did you want to jump yeah. in here? Yeah, so sometimes recruited athletes don't know which school is willing to make a commitment to them early enough to request transcripts. So encourage your student to talk to their counselors. What we can do is we can request them as if they were a regular decision, but write a note to the, the registrar's office, and they will do what's called an override and send all of those transcripts early so that they're at the school in time for your, your student's process. But before the ED deadline at the school they choose, they need to notify the counselor and the registrar's office that they've made a decision. This is a great lead into the next question, which is, um, what happens if transcripts and teacher recommendation letters arrive earlier than the student's application? Is there a placeholder for their information? Yes, there is a placeholder. Um, things do not have to uh, be sent and or arrive at the same exact time. Um, once a college receives one piece of information about a student, they will start a file um, and continuously add to that until the um, application and file is complete. 
Quinn, why don't you talk a little bit about um, whether the fact that LHS is so competitive, does that in help increase or hurt the, their chances of admissions to colleges? This reminds me of the GPA question, uh, weighted versus unweighted, because, um, I mean, I think it, honestly, in, in my opinion, it can kind of cancel each other out. Um, the school is very competitive, this high school, and it helps your students to excel in ways that I, blows me away every day when I read the, the questionnaires and interact with, with your sons and daughters throughout the, the four years. I mean, they do incredible things, and I think this school really pushes them to do so, and I think that can help them. Um, certainly, if not in college, for college admissions, then life after, even more important. Um, but in terms of their competitiveness for college, um, yeah, it helps them from that perspective, but obviously they're applying with other LHS students who are very competitive and do amazing things, and I think that's what the piece where I can say, well, it kind of evens out, and can't each other out. Um, so, but all in all, they're, they're better people, and they're more talented people because of it, so maybe that's not the, the answer you want to hear, but... Uh, could somebody just touch upon, um, sounds like there's some questions about teacher recommendations and how those, how it gets communicated to the teachers that they're to send them to the colleges, as well as what if a teacher has since left LHS but has agreed to write a letter for a student, how does that letter arrive to the college? The first question was, um, how does the teacher know and, and how is the letter processed? So we encourage most students back in junior seminar in the spring, we encouraged most of our students to have conversations last spring, starting in May and June, with two academic teachers that they would hope would write their recommendation letters. Now they are perfectly okay. Jeremy Bateman opened with this, and I wanna re-emphasize this. If they haven't asked teachers yet, they're still okay. Especially if they're thinking about regular admission, so sometime around January 1st, they're still okay, and we'll talk about that, but most students did ask and secure two teacher recommendations last spring. Now in senior seminar, we're, for the most part, we're going into session two now, and we're actually walking students through, and Tim did a slide on this, I believe, so we're walking them through how to request, thank you, Jeremy, where the teacher recommendations, we're inviting them through Naviance to submit their recommendations through Naviance. So we're doing ad request, and then as Tim had mentioned earlier, we encourage students to write a little note and to say, thank you again for agreeing to write my letter of recommendation. I hope you had a wonderful summer. You know, haven't connected yet, but my first deadline is quickly approaching. I have a November 1st deadline, and it's for this school. Then they might want to follow up. Their lists are still fluid at this point. For the most part, most students don't know exactly where they're applying yet. That is perfectly appropriate and fine. But some students do know if they have an early deadline. Again, please don't assume the takeaway is that they have to have an early deadline, but if they do, a lot of students might know just one or two schools that they're really strongly considering right now. So they'll write in that little notes section that Tim had shown you, they'll write in that notes section, you know, again, hello, good to reconnect, you know, this is my first deadline. Um, but there was a, the part two of that question was teachers that are no longer part of LHS. So that's come up a lot. I think we've had, you know, in, in recent years, we've had a lot of teachers who have retired. Um, namely, some have moved on to different places, but a lot of teachers have also retired. Now, if that teacher agreed to write the letter of recommendation, knowing about, you know, their, their plans to retire or move on, the student can approach that teacher's department head. And that department head typically won't give the student their contact information, but they will provide their department head with the student's contact information to put them in touch about how that teacher will then submit. As Emily O'Neill talked about a little bit earlier, they might not have access to Naviance anymore, obviously if they're no longer here at Lexington High School, and they might not do the Common App. I don't have a lot of teachers that have done that outside of LHS, so they might just do a regular snail mail, and that's perfectly fine, but the department head can help facilitate that contact. And I'll just jump in and add that some of the teachers who have retired, do you still have their Naviance access? Um, some of them do. So it, it really depends on what email addresses they're using, it's very technical. Um, so if your student has a um, particular teacher where that is a question, I would encourage them 
to look in Naviance and see if their name is listed there, because if it is, a new Naviance account has been made for that teacher, and they'll be able to just request through Naviance. Um, so there is a question about a student applying to international schools, and if that process looks different. Oh, Jeremy, you're back, okay. Uh, we discussed this earlier. Okay. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what is different about that process and um, any advice? Yeah, so it really, really depends on the um, intended country um, that your child would like to apply to. Um, the uh, UK has a, a very comprehensive system with some very particular rules and deadlines. Um, Canadian systems have different deadlines and different <laughs> expectations. Um, if your, your student is considering school in Japan or Korea or China, that's a whole different set of deadlines. So it's really hard to say one thing in particular um, about international applications as, as a whole. Um, reaching out to, the student should reach out to their counselor to go through some of those um, websites and some of that information together. What I can say sort of generally, at least about the UK system, is they have something called, um, I'm blanking on the term, but unless they're applying to Oxford, Cambridge, or a, a medical program, um, because they have direct entry medical training um, in that system, January 15th is their deadline. As long as they're in by January 15th, um, they are equally considered with all other students, but they're limited to five applications in that system. No, no more than five. Um, and the way an admissions counselor in the UK explained the difference to me um, is there is no such thing as a reach school in the UK system. You meet the standards or you don't. Um, and so it's a very different way of looking at admission. Um, Canada, for US-based applicants, similar. Most schools will publish a, what was their minimum standard for the admitted class the year before. Um, there's a little bit more leeway in there. Um, those deadlines are also a little bit different. There's an application deadline and then a document deadline um, that's different. So it, it is a fairly non-standard uh, system across the country, uh, across the world. I'm sorry to say, but um, we can help your student navigate. School websites are really, even for US based schools, are really your best resource to get the information directly from the school with what their deadlines and expectations are, and then we can help your students sort of parse through all of it. Okay, so this is a two part question. One is, one part is, um, is it too late to send standardized test scores um, after the college admission deadline, um, after the application has been submitted? And also, could you talk a little bit about um, transcript request de uh, deadlines and can they do them all at once or can they spread it out depending on the early versus regular application? I see Emily looks like she's ready to take this one. I will talk about the transcripts. Um, so yes, they can make multiple requests for transcripts if there's, um, if your student is, is set on an early decision school or a number of early action schools, they can make the transcript request, um, you know, or really the deadline is October 2nd, I think it is. Um, so yes, they can make a whole batch of transcript requests. If they decide to apply to some schools later on, they can make those transcript requests later on as well. Um, but each time they do have to follow the process um, take a screenshot of the transcript status page, bring it down to the registrar. Um, and they also have to make sure to let their teachers know, um, assign them as recommenders as well for those colleges later on, um, if they're separating it from November 1st and January 1st or any other deadline. Can they do them all at once? If yes, they, they can. However, um, I, and I'm guessing Emily can verify this, um, I believe if they're requesting a number of schools for November 1st and then a handful of schools for January 1st, I don't believe the registrar will send all of the transcripts and materials all together. Um, they'll just focus on the November 1st schools and then later on when they're ready to process the January 1st colleges, they'll send those um, for each individual student. Is that right? That is correct. After my five years in the registrar's office, yes, that is what they do, and that is that is um, 
because for the January 1st deadlines, they'll, when they send those, um, they want to wait for first quarter grades. So that way they're not sending two training scripts to, to schools for a regular decision application. Um, schools sometimes don't want more information um, than they're already requesting. And then the, the other part of that question that was about uh, requesting standardized test scores after, a, uh, because if they've taken a test before they've been able to submit their application. Um, so submitting standardized test scores um, after the application deadline, um, it is going to depend greatly from school to school. Most schools will have a grace period that will say, yes, we will accept um, scores after you've submitted your application. There are some schools, and the University of Michigan comes to mind, that says we want everything received on that date, and they won't take anything after it. For some schools that fall into that, they want to send the students to send a test score, but will yes. later take an update as long as an initial an initial score was recorded. So if your student tested and got scores later, they can pay again to send their new scores again, but they do need to have something to by that. Yeah. So at this time, we're going to wrap up the Q&A. We have about five minutes left. Um, I just wanted to mention that if we didn't get to your question um, and you feel you still would like to have an answer, please feel free to reach out to your student's counselor via email and um, you know, figure out a way to get the answer to your question. Usually, we can talk with the student as well, so feel free to send them along our way. We did have one um, suggestion for future presentations, that we print, make the print a little larger for uh, the folks in the audience. So yes. we'll take that. And uh, so thank you very much for your, all your great questions, and we wish you the best of luck.